But it's now it's nine weeks later than when I just was talking to you. It's 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, April 9th, 2015. We hope that you're doing great today. Uh, we certainly are. Um, today is, like I said, part two of our three-part advocacy series, uh, and today we're going to talk about the overview of the legal rules. So we're going to dive in a little deeper than we did last week, even though um, uh, obviously Abby gave us a ton of really great, useful information. Um, this week we're going to we're going to get even deeper. So we hope that you're looking forward to it. As I always say when we start these, if you have questions or comments, and we certainly hope that you do, feel free to use that chat or Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. I will be checking those periodically. So we, uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. I'll be looking at those. And we'll try to save maybe five or ten minutes uh, at the end of our webinar today for uh, question and answer. But if your question is particularly relevant uh, as we go through, we'll try to pick it up there as well. Well, so anytime you have a question, just enter it. Uh, but if I don't get to it right away, don't worry. We'll save a little bit of time at the end of our session for question and answer. Um, you know Abby Levine, Abby Levine, because you were here with us last week, um, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about herself and a little bit uh, more about our partnership to bring these advocacy webinars. And we're excited to have her here in our offices today. Abby, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much. And it's so nice to be with all of you this afternoon or morning for those of you on the one part of the country. But as Andy said, this is the second in a three-part series that Alliance for Justice and our Boulder Advocacy Initiative is partnering to conduct with BoardSource. And as part of a larger initiative, we have been working with BoardSource for the last year or so part of the Stand for Your Mission campaign, which is an effort to encourage board members and trustees of nonprofit organizations and foundations to embrace the concept of advocacy and to advocate and be ambassadors for the organizations. Um, and it's been a great partnership that has been sort of brought together with the Campion Foundation out in Seattle, Washington. In bring, working with BoardSource, us, National Council of Nonprofits, and the Forum of Regional Association of Grantmakers. And if you have not already visited the Stand for Your Mission website, I encourage you to do so. There are some good materials that talk about why advocacy is so important, which is the topic that we covered last week in much more detail. Some great guides and questions and to think about in board meetings and talking with trustees and board members of your organization. Our advocacy, an initiative of Alliance for Justice, brings to this partnership is the long history working with and advising nonprofits, both charities and private foundations, on the legal rules that apply to advocacy and helping organizations understand that advocacy is a essential tool to accomplish your mission, regardless of what your mission is, um, and providing information to to fight through the grass of often confusing and unclear rules about what organizations can do. And on our website, which is boulderadvocacy.org, we have a host of information, some materials that talk about the importance of advocacy and why advocacy, again, much of what we talked about last week. We also have a lot of resources on the legal rules, much of what we're going to talk about today. What, what are the differences and types of different types of nonprofit organizations? And how do the rules vary? What is lobbying? How much can, lob can organizations do? What can organizations do during election season? How can foundations support our work? That and much more. And so again, I encourage you to visit our website. Um, and we also have, as we'll talk about next week on the third of the third part series, um, we also have on our website some tools that you can use to assess your organization's or grantees' advocacy capacity or to evaluate advocacy. In addition to all of the great resources we have online and in addition to the trainings that we do, um, for instance, like the one we're doing this month, partnership with BoardSource, I should also mention that we have a cost-free technical assistance line. And so either me or one of my colleagues is available every day to answer questions, whether it's the topic that we're covering today or about elections or about foundations or working with other types of organizations, know that you can call us. 
And um, after the webinar, or you actually before the webinar, you received a handout that has a copy of the PowerPoint slides, and the very last slide has our contact information. I should say that while I'm a lawyer and my colleagues are lawyers, we are not your lawyer and we don't provide legal advice, but we can help walk through what the issues are, think about what the questions you might have, um, point out what the law is, and source that we encourage you, um, if you have questions, to please let us know. But with that, I really want to jump into today's topic, an overview of the legal rules. Because it's so important for nonprofit organizations to know that advocacy is legal and it's an appropriate activity for you to do. We're, what we're going to do today is really get into the details about the legal rules in terms of what advocacy means and what different types of organizations can do. So we'll start by providing a brief overview of different types of nonprofit organizations that you may hear about 501c3 organizations or 501c4 organizations or private foundations and public charities. And some of you may be going, well, what, do all, what does all that mean? We'll go through and sort of provide an overview of the different types of organizations and the different rules that apply to different nonprofits. And then we are really going to jump into the heart of today's training, really distinguishing advocacy from lobbying. And we're going to spend a lot of time going into the details of what counts as lobbying and what doesn't. And then really, we will talk a little bit about some activities that you may think are lobbying, but actually aren't. This is Overview. I could spend three hours or more talking about what's lobbying, the difference between lobbying and advocacy, how much you can do, how to track it. We're not going to do that. I'm going to try to talk for about 45 minutes and then leave time for questions. But know that, again, we do have lots more resources on our website that go through much of what I'll be co covering in much more detail. And again, feel free to contact me or my colleagues if you have questions after today's webinar. Just as, a, as well, when we're finished with the entire series, when all three are finished, we're going to put a recording up of all three of these webinars on the StandForYourMission.org uh, website as well. So again, as we start thinking about what is lobbying and what's the difference between lobbying and advocacy, we want to talk about the different types of nonprofits. Because depending on what type of nonprofit you are, what this, what makes is sort of what's key or determinative of why it matters whether something is lobbying or advocacy or not. I, for some organizations, I know that lobbying creates this fear and this thought of, well, we can't do it. And most of us, we can sort of put those fears aside and recognize that there is a lot that we can do, including activity that counts as lobbying. But under federal tax law, which is the body of law that, that tax-exempt organizations or what we often think of as nonprofit organizations that allow us to be tax-exempt of not having to pay federal income tax, um, different, has different rules for different types of tax-exempt organizations. And there are a lot of different types of tax-exempt organizations right now over 30 different kinds, most of which are found in Section 501C of the tax code. 501c3 organizations are probably the most famous, the most well-known, the most beloved. They are the charitable, religious, educational organizations. Board Source is a 501c3 organization. Alliance for Justice is a 501c3 organization. The Fair Wisconsin Education Fund is a 501c3 organization. And we are 501c3 organizations, not only do we not have to pay federal income tax, but contributions to our organizations may be tax deductible to the donor. And that ability to offer donors that tax deduction, key advantage of a 501c3 organization. 501c3 organizations are really, the, with very few exceptions, the only type of entity that can offer that tax deduction to donors. So maintaining that 501c3 status is really important. In addition, within the category of 501c3 organizations, there are actually two types of entities. There are public charities, which are what groups like Alliance for Justice, Board Source, 
Fair Wisconsin Education Fund are, organizations that receive funding from a broad array of sources and carry out programmatic activity. In the category of 501c3s, however, there's another type of entity. They're considered to be private foundations, and these are entities like the Campion Foundation, a family foundation, or the Knight Foundation, or the Ford Foundation, or the Carnegie Corporation. Private foundation funding doesn't come from a broad array of sources, but tends to come from an individual, from a family, from a corporation. And private foundations are subject to additional rules. One rule that applies to private foundations but does not apply to public charities is that private foundations need to spend at least 5% of their assets each year for charitable purposes. The most common way that they do that is by making grants. And who do they tend to make grants to? The preferred recipients for most private foundations are 501c3 public charities. So as public charities, we really have this great advantage in terms of fundraising, being able to offer those tax-deductible contributions to individual or corporate donors, and being able to receive contributions from foundations. So meaning that 501c3 status is key. Some of the rules that apply, there are a number of rules that apply to 501c3s, but some of them fall in the advocacy category. One of those rules, electoral activity. 501c3 organizations, and this is true whether the entity is a private foundation or a public charity, is absolutely prohibited from supporting or opposing candidates for public office. Organizations, 501c3s themselves, organizational resources, me or Andy in our capacity as organizational staff cannot support or oppose candidates. We can as individuals, and I could campaign for the mayor of the city of Alexandria where I live, but I need to make sure I'm using my email account, that if I make contributions, I'm doing it through my personal account and not using my work credit card, that I'm not doing any campaign activity on a line for justice time. On C3 organizations, there are also some limitations on our ability to lobby, but the limitations are actually much less than most of us think. This is one area where the rules differ between 501c3 public charities and 501c3 private foundations. 501c3 public charities can lobby. And let me say that again. 501c3 public charities can lobby. And into, during the course of this webinar, in much more detail, how much lobbying we can do, how lobbying is defined, and frankly, how few activities that your organizations may do actually fit within the definition of lobbying. Private foundations, on the other hand, are subject to more limitations. They are subject to a very prohibitive tax on any money that's spent on lobbying. It essentially means that private foundations can't lobby. Now, it doesn't mean that private foundations can't make grants to organizations that lobby, and I'm happy to take questions about that, and we have lots more information on our website about that. But this is one area where there is a big distinction. So during the course of the webinar today, I'm primarily going to be talking about the rules for 501c3 public charities. 501c3 public charities subject to these limitations we are able, again, to receive those tax-deductible contributions and those private foundation grants. 501c3 organizations are a really important part of the nonprofit sector, and they do a lot of really important advocacy work, as we talked about last week. How not the only type of organization that gets involved in advocacy. There are a lot of advocacy organizations or organizations that do advocacy that are constituted as or classified as 501c4 organizations, entities um, that are considered to be social welfare organizations, groups like the Sierra Club or the AARP or the National Rifle Association. As social welfare organizations, these entities also don't have to pay federal income tax, but contributions to them are not tax deductible and much harder for 501c3 
agency for organizations to raise money. But when organizations can raise those hard-earned dollars, they can actually spend them in more ways than can 501c3 organizations. 501c4 organizations can spend all of their money, if they want, on lobbying. There are no limits on how much lobbying they can do. And to an extent, 501c4 organizations can also support or oppose candidates for political office. And again, if more questions about the rules for 501c4 organizations, please let me know. There, I just want to also mention that there are other types of tax-exempt organizations, for instance, political organizations, entities that are classified under Section 527 of the tax code. And these are organizations like PACs, like Air Wisconsin PAC, like EMILY's List, or even um, campaign committees. Political organizations are created for the purpose of supporting or opposing candidates. They really engage in lobbying activity because their purpose is supporting or opposing candidates. And it's very rare for political organizations to be working directly with 501c3 organizations. Every now and then it may happen on some purely issue-related issues, but 501c3 organizations, while they often work in partnership with 501c4s or with labor unions or other types, it's very rare. And if you are thinking as a 501c3 about whether you can work with a political organization, feel free and call us. So understanding this overview of different types of nonprofits is really important because this really governs what your organization can do that a question came in from somebody who is not with a 501c3 or 501c4 organization, but is with a state nonprofit. And it's a, whether, and I'm not sure whether that means you're with a state entity or with an organization that was formed at the state level as a nonprofit, but did never applied for tax-exempt status as a 501c3, then it really, there's some other rules that may come into play. There are some additional rules on lobbying that apply to government agencies, and additional rules to even those 501c3 or 501c4 organizations that receive federal funding or state funding or other types of government funding. So for those of you who don't are sure whether you fit into a 501c3 co the column or the 501c4 column or you're not sure what you are, feel free to contact me after the webinar and I'm happy to talk with you about that. Um, we're going to focus now on the box that's outlined. What can 501c3 public charities do? And again, 501c3 public charities can lobby. Often talk about, and you might often hear that, you know, yes, there are limits to how much we can do. But as we'll talk about, the limits are actually quite generous. And the definition of what counts as lobbying is very Small. As I mentioned last week, a lot of the policy work that organizations do, or a lot of the work that you may consider, call civic engagement work or public policy work, is not actually considered to be lobbying. While lobbying is a type of advocacy, advocacy encompasses so much more. And so what we're going to do this afternoon is really tease out what activities fit into that yellow box that's labeled lobbying. And the activities that are in the other categories that you can do that are considered to be non lobbying advocacy. And it's the lobbying activities that are, have some limits to them under federal tax law. And again, partisan political activity for 501c3 organizations is absolutely prohibited for 501c3s. But all of the other types of advocacy, whether it's community organizing or education or research or other activities that don't fall within the lobbying limits, we can do subject to no limits at all. So understanding what counts as lobbying and what doesn't is really important. Again, people often say, well, just what's the difference between lobbying and advocacy? We need to go through in some detail what counts as lobbying because that really tells us what's not lobbying. And so again, understanding what counts as lobbying will help you better understand what doesn't count as lobbying. And again, when I talk about activities that don't count as lobbying, those are the activities that you may consider to be educational or charitable or 
public policy or advocacy. Um, but again, under federal tax law, the body of law that governs your ability to receive those tax deductible contributions, it's understanding what counts as lobbying under those rules is really important. And really understanding what doesn't count as lobbying. Again, everybody who registered received the slides before the webinar, and um, we'll, if you didn't get them, just let us know. So as we think about how much lobbying we can do, because as 501c3 organizations, public charities, we can lobby. The code makes it very clear that 501c3 public charities can lobby. And there are actually two ways that we can determine or measure how much lobbying we can do. They're called the insubstantial part test, and there is the 501H expenditure test. The insubstantial part test is the default. If your organization takes no proactive steps, nothing, you file your application to be a 501c3 organ public charity, and that's it, you are subject to the insubstantial part, part test. In order to use the 501H expenditure test, organizations need to fill out a form, and I'll talk more about that. Substantial part test is pretty much what it sounds like. A 1C3 public charity can lobby as long as lobbying is not a substantial part of its activities, or lobbying has to be an insubstantial part of the organization's activities. You might think that's great. So how do we find what's substantial? And I wish I could give you a good answer. Even though the insubstantial part test has been in the tax code for a long, long time. There is no clear definition of what counts as substantial or what counts as insubstantial. We don't know how much we can do. There are some very old court cases in which an organization spent less than 5% of their activities on lobbying and the court said, nah, that wasn't substantial. Another organization that spent more than 15% of its activities on lobbying and the court said, yep, that was substantial. But where is that magic number? We don't know. We also don't know what counts as lobbying under this test. And in a few minutes, I'll go through sort of a broad scale definition, but it's very precise to pinpoint what's lobbying and what's not lobbying under the insubstantial part test. So, can I ask you a question? Sure. What is your liability if you are in, if you have been lobbying, it hasn't substantial, but can you kind of have this plausible deniability that we thought it so, was? Uh, so it's a really good question. Most of the time, nothing happens. Lobbying reporting is self-reported, and it gets reported on the Forum 990 on Schedule C for those organizations that have to fill out um, the schedule. And I should say every organization has to fill out a 990. Um, not every organization needs to fill out schedules. Um, so it's self-reporting. The press are a few organizations. So the chief of the IRS auditing organization and revoking tax exempt status is fairly low. The 990s are publicly available documents and they're available on and organizations have to make them available if somebody requests them. And what we've seen more often is organization, somebody who doesn't like the work of your organization. I know you might think it's hard to believe that anybody may not like and support the work that your organization is doing, but somebody who might have an ideologically different viewpoint on an issue um, may look for ways to get your organization in trouble. And making allegations, whether they're right, wrong, whether the IRS does something, is one way that it, you have to focus your energy on to complaints or hiring lawyers or assuring your funders that you didn't do anything wrong. And it takes your attention and resources away from your mission-based work. And so that's why it's so important to pay attention to these rules, to have record-keeping systems in place, to make it harder to, for people to attack or to make it harder for those accusations to stick. Now, I should say, theoretically, under the insubstantial part test, if an organization has engaged in a substantial amount of activities, even in one year, the IRS theoretically could revoke your organization's tax-exempt status, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, I also say there is on Form 990 Schedule C, when organizations report lobbying under the insubstantial part test, they actually have a question that says, have you done so much lobbying this year that your lobbying is substantial? 
and I've always wondered whether anybody ever checks that right. box. Um, <laughs> Because this test is so vague, and because the theoretical penalties could severe, in the 1970s, a number of organizations got together and lobbied Congress, and they said, we need more clarity. We know we can lobby, but we want to make sure we're doing it right. We want to make sure we're not going over those limits. We want to make sure we're tracking what counts as lobbying appropriately. But in order to do that, we need guidance. So in 1976, Congress passed a new section of the tax code, which is Section 501H of the tax code. And that provides this alternative expenditure test that most organizations can use to measure their lobbying. I say most organizations because under the law, and this was at the request of organizations at the law was passed, churches and other houses of worship can elect to use the 501H expenditure test. Churches are 501C3 public charities. They are limited to how much lobbying can be done, but they have to use that insubstantial part of the test. Other public charities, on the other hand, can choose to use this 501H expenditure test, and organizations choose to do that by filing IRS Form 5768 with the IRS, or what we often refer to as making the 501H election to measure your lobbying under this expenditure test. Organizations fill out the form only once. It's not something you have to do every year, but it changes the way you track your lobbying, and in many cases, it changes what counts as lobbying and what you need to report. As the name implies, under this expenditure test, organizations only need to track how much money they're spending on lobbying. Under the insubstantial part test, Organizations have to look at how much money they're spending and what are the activities that they're doing. The expenditure test, we're not looking at all of our activities. We're not looking at what our board members are doing. We're not looking at what our volunteers are doing. We're only looking at how much money the organization is spending. And there is a clear formula where we know, based on the size of our organization, how much money we can spend. So we can better plan. We can be more strategic in our, our work to determine when lobbying we can do and maybe when to spend more money or when to spend less money. And there are more clear definitions of what counts as lobbying and what doesn't. And finally, as if all of those benefits weren't enough, the penalty for exceeding your lobbying limits in a particular year isn't nearly as significant. If an organization exceeds its lobbying limits, it will be subject to an excise tax. But the IRS cannot revoke an organization's tax-exempt status, in most of our cases the lifeblood of our organization, unless we exceed our, limit, our lobbying limits by 150% over four consecutive years. So the FICH expenditure test provides a lot more guidance a lot more clarity, a lot more comfort for organizations. And we recommend that most organizations use the 501H expenditure test. We have lots of resources on our website, including this lovely blue and white guide, Worry-Free Lobbying for Nonprofits, as well as some other fact sheets that go into great detail about the 501H expenditure test. And I encourage you to download those if you're not familiar with it. And again, the insubstantial part test, in many cases, like driving on a highway where you can't see the speed limit, getting pulled over, and getting a ticket for speeding when you had no idea when you were what the rules were, where the 501H expenditure test is much more clear because we're looking at how much money we're spending, and it's much easier to track. So under the 501H expenditure test, how much lobbying can an organization do? We, it's a lot more clear than it can't be insubstantial. So how do we figure out what that is? Well, there is a formula. Organizations need to figure out what their exempt purpose expenditures are, which is pretty much a fancy way of saying, how much money do you spend in a given year, in your tax year? It's not how much money you have in the budget, it's how much money you're hoping to raise, it's how much money do you spend. And based on your annual expenditures, you apply a percentage. For those 501c3 public charities that spend $500,000 or less a year, 
which is the vast majority of public charities in this country. What's our lobbying limit? 20%. That means for organizations that spend less than $500,000 in a given year, you can spend up to one-fifth of your total spending on lobbying. A lot. And as you'll see, as the organization's annual expenditures increase, the percentage goes down a little, little bit. A million dollars. There is a million dollar cap in the 501H expenditure test. That is probably the only downside of the 501H expenditure test. No organization, no matter how large it is, can ever spend more than a million dollars under the 501H expenditure test. And this is why some really large organizations may choose to use the, in, the insubstantial part test, because they find that, that for budgets, you know, with $20 million budgets, that even 3% or 1% you know, of their annual spending may be greater than a million dollars. But those are organizations that can hire lawyers and can really think through, you know, how do they track it. But for most of us, most of us wish we had a million dollars to spend on anything. And most organizations come nowhere close to their lobbying limits. And we have on our website what we call the Lobbying Expenditure Calculator, which is an Excel document that you can go in and put in your annual expenditures, and it'll do the math for you and tell you what your lobbying limit is. There are also two types of lobbying limits under the 501H expenditure test. When the law was written, it differentiated between direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying. And I will go through those definitions in detail in just a minute. But for reasons that don't make a lot of sense, Kong said that an organization can spend its entire lobbying limit on direct lobbying, which essentially means contacting legislators to express a view about legislation. Organizations could hire lobbyists, could have staff contacting legislators directly of legislation and you could spend their entire lobbying limit on that. Organizations can only spend one-fourth or 25% of their lobbying limit urging the public to contact their legislators. And I'll let you use your imaginations of why that may be. But it's important to track both your overall lobbying limit and your grassroots lobbying limit. And you need to report those to the IRS on Form 990. So it's just a pictorial graphic that organizations can spend all of their lobbying limit on direct lobbying, but can't spend more than one-fourth on grassroots lobbying. So then we get to the question of what is lobbying. Under the 501H expenditure test, we have very clear definitions, or as clear as anything gets in tax law, of what counts as lobbying. And as you can see from the slide, and as just there are two types of lobbying. There's direct lobbying, which is where an organization communicates with a legislator to express a view about specific legislation. And there's grassroots lobbying, where an organization communicates with the general public on an organization's website or an ad in the paper, expresses a view about specific legislation. But under the 501H expenditure test, as we'll talk about, in order for communication to the public to constitute grassroots lobbying, there needs to be a call to action. One of the big differences between the definitions of lobbying under the 501H expenditure test and the insubstantial part test is that under the insubstantial part test, there may not be that requirement to have a call to action. So simply expressing a view about a bill simply saying we think Congress should increase, should support the bill, should pass the bill to increase food stamps, under the insubstantial part test, that may very well be lobbying. Under the 501H expenditure test, we may be able to say with great certainty that isn't lobbying. So again, we have more a more narrow definition of lobbying under the 501H expenditure test. And that is the definition that I'm going to go through in a bit more detail. It's important as you think about interactivity lobbying, or in some cases for some organizations thinking about how do we make our activities not be lobbying, to remember these elements. Because these, and this is the way when somebody calls me or I'm thinking about it, what I'm doing is lobbying. I go through and think, okay, who am I talking to? Who is my audience? Will it be direct lobbying possibly or grassroots lobbying? And then do I have all of these elements? And so we're going to now go through and define each of these elements. 
So for direct lobbying, for either type of lobbying actually, we need to have a communication. You talk this all day and talk to yourself, as sometimes I do, talk to colleagues, you know, but if you never go outside of your conference room or outside of the room, you know, you're not lobbying. You need to have an actual communication. And that communication can be an in-person visit, it could be a telephone call, it could be an email, a letter, it could be a tweet, it could be a Facebook post, or communication, frankly, could even be cake. Cake is a good illustration of, is a way, good way to illustrate the benefits of the 501H expenditure test. Now, sadly, I think cake, delivering cakes to a member of Congress now probably violate the congressional ethics rules, which is a whole separate issue. But a number of years ago, an organ, when Congress was considering Medicare reauthorization, an organization did, delivered cakes to every member of Congress, and each cake had a slice missing. And the meaning piece of cake, it said, add the miss, add um, arcs in Medicare now, add the missing piece. This was communication. And lobbying communication because it was about expressing a view about legislation and they were given to legislators. But again, under the 501H expenditure test, we're looking at costs. So if an organization went out to a bakery and bought the cakes and spent $20 each on a cake, They've now spent over $10,000, $20 times 535 cakes, on this lobbying message. Another organization may have thought, that's brilliant. We're going to deliver cakes too, but we're going to go to Costco. We're not going to spend $20 on a cake. We're going to spend $5. Now, the, the second organization may have delivered the exact same message, but they've only spent one of the cost, so they may only have to report about $2,500, if I've done that math right in my head, um, on their lobbying report. Another organization may be like, oh my gosh, that's, that's great. We're gonna do that, but we're gonna have our volunteers bake the cakes. So now this third organization may be delivering the exact same cake to the exact same people with the exact same message, and this organization may have to report zero against its lobbying limit. So under the 501H expenditure test, not what your message is, it's not how many people you deliver it to, it's not how effective or yummy your message is, it's how much are you spending to deliver it. On the, 501, on the insubstantial part test, on the other hand, even if a bakery donated the cakes to your organization, you would still have to count the full fair market value of the cakes under the insubstantial part test. So I need to illustrate. Um, so for direct lobbying, we need a communication, and the communication needs to be with a legislator. Who is a legislator? It's members of legislative bodies, and members of legislators at every level of government, federal, state, local, and frankly, at an international level as well. And it includes the elected legislators and their staff. Mind when we think about legislators, it's members of the executive branch. Um, or excuse me, of the legislative branch, those folks, government officials who are in Congress or in the state legislature. Every now and then, however, a member of the executive branch may be considered to be a legislator. It doesn't happen often, but it happens when the executive branch official is participating in the formulation of legislation. So if organizations were urging the president to sign a bill into law for purposes of that about signing the bill, the president is considered to be a legislator. Or if you are urging your governor to veto a bill, the communication urging the veto will be a communication about the formulation of legislation. And the same thing may hold true if you're talking about a budget appropriation or the budget that the governor introduces, or if you're communicating with the Secretary of Health and Human Services about a bill that she's heavily involved in. But again, the, the, we're really talking about for lobbying a federal tax law definition to be dealing with legislators. We need to be dealing with someone who formulates legislation. Now, someone's elected doesn't mean they're a legislator. In many cases, members of school boards, for instance, or zoning commissions may be elected, but they don't actually meet the definition of a legislator. So again, 
it's important to distinguish between are you communicating with a legislator or are you communicating with an executive branch or an administrative um, government official. A special rule that most of the time when we're communicating with members of the public, that falls into the grassroots lobbying category. Except when we're talking about ballot measures or referenda or tax levies or constitutional amendments, whatever form it may take in your community. In that case, it's not our elected legislators that determine whether something passes or fails. It's us, the voters. So most of the time when we're communicating to the public, it would fall under the grassroots category. Except when we're talking about ballot measures, we, the voters, are considered to be legislators. But simply talking to a legislator does not mean you're lobbying. Again, just as you're talking to a legislator doesn't mean you're lobbying. In order for that communication with the legislator to be lobbying, you need to be expressing a view about specific legislation. This legislation may be a bill that's already been introduced that has very formally written out. It may be a budget confirmation of a judge that needs to be confirmed by the Senate. Or it may be a bill that's been introduced in another state that you want to encourage your state legislature to introduce. Or sometimes it may be discouraging legislators from introducing a bill. When we're talking about specific legislation, it's often things that have already been introduced but it may also be trying to get legislators not to introduce something. There is a big difference between expressing a view about specific legislation versus expressing a view about an issue. Talking with legislators about the need to increase funding for the arts in a community is not necessarily lobby. If you were meeting the legislator and said, we need to increase um, or we need to um, to create a tax on an, increase the sales tax where a portion of those of the tax funds will be given to the arts. Now we're talking about specific legislation. We're talking about a specific solution that can only be accomplished through the legislature. But talking about an issue, talking about we need to do something about climate change. For those of you in California, we need to do something to deal with water crisis. That by itself is not lobbying. When we're expressing a view about specific legislation, we need to be thinking about what is that legislative, what is that solution, and that solution needs to be to, to come through legislation. A lot of types of advocacy activities that are not dealt with through specific legislation. So for instance, litigation, that may be an effective advocacy strategy filing a lawsuit or filing an amicus brief, even challenging the constitutionality of a law is not dealing with specific legislation. Essentially, specific legislation needs to be voted on by a legislative body. Judges are not legislative bodies. If you're working with trying to get the governor to issue an executive order or the president to issue an executive order, so all immigration groups are Banging in with the president, trying to get him to issue an executive order on um, dreamers. That policy, that policy work, but because they were getting seeking an executive order, it was not lobbying under federal tax law. Work with administrative agencies, whether it's the Department of Health and Human Services, a State Department of Health, the State Department of Education, Secretary of State's office, whatever agency. Regulations, implement programs, some comments on what rules and regulations should look like is not considered to be specific legislation. Again, specific legislation requires a vote of a legislative body. If the policy result can be achieved in another way through the executive branch by itself, the judicial branch is not considered to be lobbying. Looking, seeking the enforcement of existing laws, monitoring the enforcement. Again, a really important advocacy activity, but not considered to be lobbying. And just some real 
quickly some examples of organizations that were urging people to um, contact the Environmental Protection Agency to do safeguards to keep dangerous coal pollution out of the air. Because it's dealing with an administrative action, it's not considered to be lobbying. Again, seeing executive orders, not lobbying. Investigation, not lobbying. So it's really important as we think about what counts as lobbying under federal tax law, what do 501c3 organizations need to track under the 501h expenditure test, what counts as lobbying. It's important to recognize that it's for direct lobbying, it's communicating with a legislator to express a view about specific <clears throat> legislation. Again, much of the time, organizations are not communicating directly with legislators. Sometimes we're doing that, but sometimes we're trying essentially to rally the troops. We're trying to get people in the community or the legislators' constituents to come weigh in with legislators. In most cases, that falls into the grassroots lobbying category, with the one caveat that I mentioned of ballot measures. So for it to be grassroots lobbying, we need to have a communication, and again, all the forms of communication we talked about before with the general public. And again, that could be posting something on your organization's website, taking an ad in the newspaper or on radio, going to the state fair, passing out flyers, all sorts of things. It could be a speech, it could be a letter to the editor, an op-ed, forms of communications to the general public. And that communication needs to express a view about specific legislation. But I hinted at before, in order for communication to the general public to constitute lobbying, there needs to be this added element, this call to action. And in many cases, this is what distinguishes something that's lobbying from not lobbying. What is a call to action? There are four very specific types of calls to action, and organizations need to have at least one of these actions for the communication to be grassroots lobbying. So communication needs to say, call your legislator, tell them to contact their legislators about this bill, or you need to provide the contact information, or provide a mechanism for contacting legislators, or listing legislators. So again, let's go through some examples. This is a sort of a call to action where all ZIF has an action alert and they say their respective senators and House members today. And they go on and provide the phone number. Saying call your legislators today is a type of call to action. Just providing the phone number is a call to action. A lot of times organizations will combine calls to action. This one that says, call legislators, but also list the legislators who will be um, voting. It provides their contact information. So again, it provides a variety of types of calls to action. One of the more common ones that we see is where organizations not only urge you to contact legislators, but then provide the form for you to do so. And this is a type of call to action. You need to have one of these calls to action, and you need to have all of those other elements. So if you have an action alert, which a lot of times organizations do, that says call the EPA and tell them to um, change their standards. That may be asking people to contact the government, but it's not contacting legislators. So again, we need to have all of these elements present. Now, if an organization does not have a call to action, so for instance, you write a letter to the editor and talk about why the Senate needs to increase funding for food stamps, but you don't include a call to action, you are not lobbying. And again, that's one of the very clear differences between what counts as lobbying under the 501H expenditure test and under the insubstantial part test. Again, as long as you leave off that call to action when you're communicating to the public, it's not lobbying. I should mention, as I said at the beginning, that private foundations, entities like the Campion Foundation or the Ford Foundation, that themselves can't spend money on lobbying, any these are the definitions that they use to determine what's lobbying. So if it doesn't count as lobbying under the 501H expenditure test definitions, it's not lobbying for the foundations as well. So 
important, it's important to understand and keep track of these different elements. So here's an example. This is an ad that says, the more these costs, the less they'll smoke. Tell the legislature, raise the cigarette tax. Call the Maine legislature and provide the phone numbers for the Maine House and Senate. Protect our kids, not big tobacco. This is a classic grassroots lobbying campaign. It's education to the public, because it's an ad, it's expressing you about specific legislation, raise the cigarette tax, and it has several calls to action. Tell the legislature, call the legislature, and the phone numbers. But what if an organization still wanted to express a view on the issue of the cigarette tax, but did not want to lobby for whatever reason? Out this ad that says, the more these costs, the less they'll smoke, raise the cigarette tax, protect our kids, not big tobacco. This ad that is to the general public does not include a call to action. And so this ad by itself is not lobbying. So again, understanding what counts as a call to action is really important. I just want to real briefly walk through a few exceptions and then take some of the questions that have come in. There are activities um, and these are just some other examples, some activities that technically meet the definition of lobbying, but for various policy reasons have been carved out. One is what's called examinations and discussions of broad economic and similar issues. So again, if you're just talking about an issue and not getting to the actual solutions or what the legislative solution should be, that's not lobbying. We don't have a whole lot in the formal sense. But what we do see a lot is organizations creating what are called nonpartisan analyses, often white papers or studies. And in, for these documents, and they could be a written document, it could be a video, it could be some other type of communication, the communication needs to have what's considered to be a full and fair discussion of the issue and needs to broadly disseminate it. Assuming you do that, you can express a view, including a view on legislation. And these reports could be disseminated to legislators. But again, it's more than just simply saying this is what this is our view, but it has to provide a full and fair discussion. An exception that applies to nonprofits very often is what's called the request for technical advice or assistance, where an organization is invited to provide testimony to a legislative body or other governmental body. The key for this exception is that you want to get the request in writing, and the request needs to come from the legislative body itself. It's not enough that one legislator that you're talking to or the sponsor of the bill asks you what you think. The request needs to be made by, on behalf of the committee or on behalf of a task force. Finally, the last exception is what's called defense. And this is one that doesn't apply as often as groups often want it to, um, but it is one that particularly the private foundation um, sector has been able to take advantage of in the past. This is where there's legislation that affects the powers and duties of an organization, the tax-exempt status of the organization, or the ability to receive um, tax-deductible contributions. Um, so something that would change the the tax structure of an organization, for instance, or would say that 501c3 organizations could no longer receive tax deductible contributions um, would fit within the self-defense exception. I want to just point out that we do have resources on our website um, that talk about the record keeping systems. We have publications that talk about um, track, a guide to record keeping advocacy charities that provide some best practices for tracking lobbying, both under the insubstantial part test and under the 501H expenditure test. And then we also have an in-depth guide being a player that walks through these rules and definitions in much more detail. And we have lots of other fact sheets on our website. Um, and again, here is contact information um, with our email address, which is advocacy at afj.org, where you can email questions. You can do it through our website, which is boulderadvocacy.org, or you can call us um, at 866 number. But I want to stop there and be able to answer some of the questions that have come in. Okay, so we have several questions, and some of these kind of uh, go back to, you know, areas that we were discussing. So. It, 
up if it feels like we're jumping around a little bit, but we're going to try to get to these now. Um, so, and you might have answered a couple of these while we were talking. Sure. So, but so for 501c3 public charities, did you say that the only lobbying act that only lobbying activities, not other forms of advocacy, are limited? That is correct. Is that irregardless of uh, if we use the insubstantial part test of the 501 It is. That under federal tax law only limits lobbying. And so all of the activities that don't meet the definition of lobbying under federal tax law are not subject to those limits. It's much easier to know what counts as lobbying, what fits into that yellow box that was on one of the original slides under the 501H expenditure test. The definition is much more vague under the insubstantial part test, so we often don't know whether an activity is lobbying or not. But again, for public charities, and frankly for private foundations as well, if the activity does not meet the definition of lobbying, it's not subject to the restrictions. Again, it doesn't support or oppose candidates. Okay. This, okay, so if you are asking for another organization or going on behalf of another organization's cost, it's your organization. Not sure if I said that right, Hope. So does that yeah. make sense to you? So that's okay. a great question. So, and that, again, is one of the differences of whether you're measuring your lobbying under the 501H expenditure test or the insubstantial part test. Under the insubstantial part test, we have to look at and sort of track and report all of our activities both money that we spent and activities that we did. Under the 501H expenditure test, we're looking only at money spent. So if another organization asks us to put our name on an ad and the other organization paid for the design of the ad, they paid for the placement of the ad, they did all the research behind the ad, and they just said, can we put Alliance for Justice's name on it? They say, yes, you can put our name on it. Our organization and technically is lobbying, but because we use the 501H expenditure test, there is virtually no cost, maybe 10 minutes of my time and of you know, that small percentage of my salary that I spent reviewing it. But again, we don't have to be under the 501H expenditure test. We're only looking at how much we spend. I don't have to track how much the other organization spent. Again, if you're sending out an action alert to other organizations asking them to sign on, that may be grassroots lobbying, it may be lobbying, but for organizations that get information and they say, oh, this looks, you know, why not board source, I trust them, I'm going to sign on, technically it might be lobbying, but there's going to, chances are there's going to be very little cost associated with that. I should also say, and there's some more information on our website about that, there, is, there are some special rules if an organization is reaching out to its members. Reaching out to your organization's members and asking them to contact legislators, that will technically be considered to be direct lobbying um, because members are considered part of the organization. And the benefit of something being considered to be direct lobbying is that, again, we can spend all of our lobbying limit on direct lobbying, but only a portion on grassroots lobbying. Um, sure. So would it matter if the campaign for Tobacco Free Kids campaign had a website that had a call to action on it? Fabulous question. It's something that I usually get into in longer trainings, um, but absolutely. So if there is a website that doesn't have a call to action, but it's talking about specific legislation, and it links to a website, for instance, that has a call to action on that homepage, that is probably, that link will be attributed back to the ad. If you are directly linking to something with a call to action on it. Awesome. Okay, is this lobbying? Asking a local zoning board to approve a zone change for your agency's mm -hmm. new building it is one composed of appointed officials by elected, uh, by local Local story. And two, their decision is binding and only, can only be overturned by the mayor or council. That's a really good question and one that I would need to talk with you more about. Zoning boards and zoning commissions are structured differently in every community, it seems. And for the most part, they won't be, but before I give a blanket answer to that, I would want to look into a little bit more about the process. And so, that goes into one of my catch-all answers of it depends, but feel free to contact me and I'm happy to try to explore that more. 
Okay. Uh, what if C4 staff sit in on meetings with legislators when members of the C4 are asking legislators to vote a certain way? Is that lobbying for the C4 if the C4 is present to help members tell their story and influence others? So it probably is that if your staff sitting in with members that are Asked to vote a certain way, I would say that's lobbying. But the great thing about a C4 organization is that you are not subject to the lobbying limits. And so you, even if something is lobbying, the answer in many cases is so what? Um, because okay. you don't have to deal with those limits. Okay, last question. If you are a state slash local organization 501c3 under the arm of a nationwide 501c3, are the activities separated? Um, a great question and another one where it will depend on how the organization is structured. Some national organizations um, have one 501c3 status and all of the reporting gets aggregated together and 990 is filed and all and the, the national may you know, support out its lobbying limit to the different affiliates. Um, in which case it's really important to be in close contact with national, international organization. On the other hand, sometimes some organizations have, you know, have the national, but then the locals may separately incorporate it, and then it may be slightly different. But if you have questions about that, it's always really important to look at or to see whether your organization has something called a group exemption. And so it's really important to check with your organization's um, executive director, ask those questions to find out exactly how your organization is structured. Um, and if you have questions or, about that, feel free again to contact me. Okay, uh, just one quick follow-up from earlier um, when we were asking about the campaign uh, for, for tobacco-free kids. So to follow up, that means if the ad does not have a call to action but mentions a website that has a call to action, that it on it, that is lobby. Yes. If you are directly linking to, so if you link to the home page of the website and there on the home page is the call to action, the, arguably if the call to action is buried deeper into the website, maybe not. Um, the website as a whole is some area where the IRS has provided very little guidance. I should say we have another publication on our website that you can download, um, all of these can be downloaded for free, called um, Public Policy in the Digital Age that talks about these very kinds of questions. Um, so I encourage you to, to look at that and to think about how it applies to both web links, but also work that you're doing on Twitter and Facebook and other social media channels. Okay. All right. Well, it is a little bit after 3 o'clock, so we're going to uh, let everybody go. But thank you very much for joining us. Next week, it will be our last in this series, uh, and that one is Putting It All Together, How to Incorporate Advocacy into Your Organization. Uh, Abby Levine will be in New York. I will be here, but we were gonna we are gonna have a great uh, hour together. So join us then. Thank you everybody for uh, joining us today, and we will see you soon. Goodbye, Take everybody. Take care.